one day I kind of woke up and I thought, wait a minute, if normal real estate agents can make a living doing this and I'm making the same as a normal real estate agent on these transactions, could I make a living doing this? And around that time, uh, I started writing for a big real estate investing website and just the traction of the whole thing was picking up to no end. And I ended up leaving my corporate job and I've been in the referral business ever since. And a great book can totally challenge your conventional thinking and change your life for good. However, some of us just don't have the luxury of time of sitting down to read a book. But there are some instances in which we do have dead time. And these are perfect times to learn. So we can learn while driving instead of jamming to the same music on the radio. Or maybe at the gym. Well, now you can. Dwelling has partnered with Amazon's Audible to give you the Dwell listeners a free book. Yes, a free book. So all you have to do is go to audibletrial.com forward slash dwelling and download your free book. This will also be in the show notes. You can click on the link. And if you don't have a book in mind and you say, Ola, I don't actually know where to start with. Well, awesome. Because I can tell you what to start with today. It's a quintessential classic. It's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So download Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that would basically just take your mind on a different spin. Of course, I'm always open to hear um, from our Dwell listeners. So email me at ola at dwelling.com. And then feel free to also give us a, a rating and review. This really helps us to rank better in iTunes. I can't wait to hear from you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ali, for joining us here today on The Dwelling Show. I really appreciate your time. Um, super pumped and excited to, to hear your story. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk. And yeah, I love seeing where these kinds of things go. So I'm all, I'm all in. Awesome. So... Ali, I'm sure you can just give us a quick brief about kind of your story, you know, why you got started in real estate and kind of what you've been up to lately. Sure. Uh, so the brief on how I got started in real estate is that I did not plan for it whatsoever. Uh, my only goal was to figure out a way out of my corporate job. I used to be an engineer uh, and I, from the minute I walked into my first gray cubicle, I knew I wanted out. So I just started researching and I spent quite a few years uh, really just kind of, I was going to seminars, you know, like weekend real estate seminars or just kind of networking with anyone I could meet and trying to find the thing that would stick. And I eventually started finding some investment opportunities that worked for me. And I thought it was just going to be kind of a side investing thing. And I got so excited about it. Everybody was asking me what I was buying and one thing led to another. And now I was able to actually start my own company, um, in the real estate industry, which is kind of cool. And we'll, I'm sure we'll get to more of the specifics of what I work on, but um, yeah, so I've been in business now in real estate for about five years. And currently my latest gig is uh, mo all of my portfolio has been out of state uh, run by property managers, like buy and hold properties. And most recently some partners and I have bought a duplex local to me in Venice beach and I am currently acting the landlord on it. So it's uh, for, for someone who's been pretty anti-landlording my entire career, I am now reminding myself why I've been anti-landlording. But it's, it's been interesting. I've been learning a lot. So that's kind of my, that's my latest. Wow. A broad spectrum right there. So from going to real estate seminars, networking with people, and then becoming a landlord in Venice Beach, California, right? And all we hear about California is there's no deals, there are no deals, there are no deals. So before we even jump to that, I kind of <laughs> want to, you know, backtrack a little bit and we also get into your company as well. So you go into that cube at your corporate job and you're like, uh, no, <laughs> I cannot be contained. This is yeah. not for me. I don't want to do this and I want something else. So can you just kind of walk us through how you started that journey, you know, going to the seminars and how did you formulate your tactics to really network with people and make, you know, the real minis work for you? Well, one of, I, I'm already laughing because one of my favorite phrases throughout that entire time, my mom actually taught it to me and my mom is usually pretty conservative and just, you know, real uh, straightforward. And she, she taught me the phrase of fake it till you make it. And it really, it, it worked. It stuck with me. Like I'd go to different seminars and I would try and network with people. And I never came across sounding, you know, don't fake it so hard that you sound fake, but I would just kind of 
come in with the mindset of, Hey, I'm doing this. And you know, I'm serious because I wanted people to take me seriously, but it's kind of that whole, like, how do you get experienced without work and how do you get work without experience type of thing? So you kind of have to find a fine balance of if you've never done anything, at least sounding like you're capable and you're serious and you're whatever. So I did that quite a bit. And a lot of my journey, my journey was a little bit longer than if you're just going in and you're looking for real estate investments, I don't expect your journey to figure that out to be anywhere near the length of mine. My journey was to get out of my corporate job. Like I needed out of that. And so that's obviously a bit of a bigger feat than uh, just investing. Um, but the thing for me was I just wanted to, I just wanted to see and hear everything and start to figure out what felt good and what was sticking. So I found particular authors that I like. So I kept reading their books. I go to some seminars and you know, a lot of real estate seminars are really sales based. Like it's sales pitchy and half the seminar is all these upsells and everything else. But if you can ignore that, they actually can give really good information. So I really was just trying to get information from anywhere possible and anything that I could try, I would try. Like I went with a real estate agent around Orange County one time and I was shopping for properties and I had told him I was a very serious rental property buyer, which by no means was true. <laughs> I, did. I just, but I needed, I needed to learn something. And so I went around those properties and I couldn't figure, I didn't know at the time how to run rental property numbers, but something didn't seem to add up and I couldn't quite figure out what, but then I used that as a launching point to figure out what am I looking for or what would make a good investment and, you know, just really following the, the course of what opportunities and options came my way. And then at some point I had to make the decision like, okay, I've got to hone in on something because I was researching so much stuff that I was kind of getting lost in it and I wasn't able to, you know, start really seriously pursuing anything. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really, I think the most important thing is really being true to yourself and finding the things and the people who resonate with what you really want, because there's so many different strategies in real estate and some of them accomplish one thing, some of them accomplish another and, you know, spending the time, it's a little bit of self exploration, but finding what, things really jive with you. So the more you read, the more you research, you can, you can kind of start narrowing that focus down. That's absolutely correct. That is so true. I mean, there's a lot of things in it that you said that I really liked. I mean, they all fake it till you make it. Um, I mean, it's also, I think it bleeds into like mindset. Like if you're going to RIAs, you're talking to people, you're talking to wholesalers, you're talking to other investors. I mean, your brain, whether it likes it or not, would have to start to become this new person you're trying to be. Right. So that I think that's like really fascinating. And you also said, you know, you were doing a lot of reading. Right. So yeah. and you also mentioned that helped you to kind of really mold what you're going after. Can you give us a, like a real life example? So if like a dual listener is listening to this and they're thinking, well, wh what did Ali really mean by that? Just as far as like the books I read and all that or. Right. And how did that kind of help you really determine your path and your strategy? Well, I think for me. Uh, the biggest thing for me, one of my favorite phrases, everyone asked me like if of my favorite quote or whatever, and it's don't take advice from people you went and trade shoes with. And the flip side of that is find the people who are doing what you're interested in doing or who are living the lifestyle that you want to live or, you know, whatever jives with you and listen to their advice. So that's what I really took to heart when I was reading books. So like most real estate investors, the first book I ever read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. And when I read that book, I think that book is fun. I mean, I think everybody has to read it, but he was a big advocate of passive income and his explanations of like the, the business owner versus the employee versus the whatever. I immediately, I was like, I want to follow this guy's advice. Like I, for example, would easily follow Robert Kiyosaki. I have no interest in following someone like Dave Ramsey. Like he's great for his, uh, for the, inf I think he's great with the information he provides. I think it's very valuable, but he doesn't promote the kind of lifestyle that I want. Whereas Robert Kiyosaki's spiels, if you will do. And so as I kept reading, like for instance, I liked Robert Kiyosaki. So I read probably nine or 10 of his books and like I would find the authors that really were exemplifying what it was I was looking for. And I listened to them. 
So that was a big thing in my book choices for sure. Wow. Nine to 10 books just from Robo Kiyosaki. Wow. I read two and I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I could take over the world. That is amazing. I mean, that is well, at the cool. time I was so excited about it. I was reading them. I was reading them pretty fast. I was, I was motivated. And, you know, people can say what they want about him because he obviously has a lot of seminars, a lot of workshops, a lot of them can be expensive. And so many people, he sells education. So, so many people buy into this education, but they never end up doing anything mm -hmm. and then they knock it. But the reality is the information, I guarantee you, I would not be where I was today without everything I read in Robert Kiyosaki's books. No doubt in my mind. So back to seminars then. So there's a lot of, you know, I love what you said that, you know, of course there can be sales PG and if, if you can just ignore all that stuff, I really like what you said. So if there's a, a newbie or wannabe investor listening to us now, how can they dodge? I don't want to say the bullet, but you know, how can they dodge, you know, paying that 25 grand, you know, on a very hyper, you know, Saturday seminar, how can they really take that mindset of, look, I can actually go out there and actually buy a property with that same 25 grand. Yeah. You know, I think the most important thing I, I actually, I, I have a whole business side of me too. I do business consulting. And one of the things that I end up telling people constantly is don't create your business until you've started the business. And what I mean by that is don't invest huge amounts of money or time or whatever into doing what you think will work out. So for example, if the Rich Dad series has a $25,000 course on flipping, I've never taken one of those courses, but I have every reason to believe it's probably got really good information. Like it, if you do it right, I would imagine you make well more than your $25,000 investment. However, I don't think necessarily that anyone should take that $25,000 course if they haven't already started flipping. And so like if you get into it and it's working and things are going maybe you've even flipped a property, but you're confused on a lot of stuff or whatever, then invest whatever you want into learning more about it. But I think one of the biggest pitfalls is somebody goes to the three day weekend course and they're like, Oh, Hey, you can do this $5,000 course on flipping or this $5,000 course on wholesaling. And you're like, well, obviously that's what I should be doing. Or yeah, wholesaling sounds great, but you really don't know until you get into it, if it's even going to jive with you at all. And so I don't think the courses are bad, but I really encourage people to start doing something before you do one of those big courses. And oftentimes by then you find out you don't need the big course, but you know, so much of it is just finding out what is really in your natural grain. Like I would love to be a flipper because I could make tons of money and I think it would be really fun. But the reality is it's not in my natural grain at all. So if I went and spent $25,000 on a flipping course right now, I'd really just kind of be digging myself a hole. Whereas I've followed my rental property um, path and it's, it's been very natural for me and I've able, been able to have a lot of success with it. So I think that's the big thing to just keep in mind is don't dive in too soon. Like start small, you know what, do the $500 weekend course for sure. I think those are great. And that's, you know, not a pocket breaker investment. So yeah, just, just going slowly, go from the 500, maybe you find a thousand dollar thing and just go slow before just dumping all your money into a big one that you have no idea if it's going to stick or not. I really, really like that as well. Like don't start your, well, don't invest until you actually start. I've never heard that before. That is really, really good. That I actually really think good. I just made it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it. Those are the best ones, right? Those are the best yeah. ones. But you know, it's the same as with business because I see people all the time. They wait to start selling their product or their service until everything's perfectly in line. Their website, their business cards, their business plan, their bank account, their business credit card. And they've not, they've not made a penny yet. And I, so that's why, you know, that's why I mean by don't create your business until you've started the business, like start doing the thing that's going to make you the money and see if it starts making you money. And then you can create a business around it if it works. Awesome. Awesome. So before we even go into like, you know, your business, so you learned all this stuff, you went to a few seminars, you started building your network and your team, you read you know, a ton of books, you know, the stuff. What was your first deal? How did you find it and how did you fund it? Well, my first, uh, my first unintentional deal was uh, converting my primary house in Atlanta to a rental property when I took a job transfer to California. So that was technically my first investment property, but it was completely 
unintentional. And my first intentional investment property, oddly enough, was a beach. It was a pre-construction beach bungalow in Nicaragua. And <laughs> when I when I saw an advertisement for it originally, all I saw was rebellious and adventurous. And I was like, I'm in. I <laughs> I, I don't have any choice but to pursue that one. Um, so that started my real estate career. And unfortunately, that deal ended up not panning out, which is a whole other podcast in itself talking about the risk of pre-construction investments. But it really propelled me into everything else. So after the Nicaragua stuff was going on and had started, I had made a lot of contacts in real estate at that point. And this concept of turnkey rental properties came up. And at the time, uh, one of the best markets that everybody saw the big boom coming with was Atlanta, which was convenient because I happen to be from Atlanta. And so for the fact that it was in Atlanta, I, it really caught my eye and I started pursuing those. And that is what I ended up sticking with for the whole duration of my investing career until recently I bought the local property. But otherwise, I've ended up sticking around out of state uh, turnkey rental properties the whole time. Fascinating. So, you know, if somebody also listening to this thinking, well, so you're just buying, you know, stuff, not in your backyard, like we've heard on some other part or some other podcast, you know, buy in your backyard, buy something close to your house, but you're doing this out of state. How mm -hmm. do you do that? Well, you know, there's a wide spectrum of what you can buy out of state and how you can do it. So I'd say on the riskiest end, if you want to go buy a distressed property in a, a random property and rehab it and do all those things, I think you can start getting into a really risky arena because you're not local. Like I've learned that I need to be present for something like a rehab. But on the other end of the spectrum, I've always been involved with turnkey rental properties where somebody else is doing all the hard stuff. They're finding the distressed properties, they're rehabbing it, they're putting tenants in, they're placing property managers. And so that way, the only thing that you really have to do is, which is easy to do from afar, is your due diligence on the property. And then once you own it, you're just keeping an eye on the property manager to make sure he's still functioning. And so that takes a huge amount of the workload out. But with either of those things, because you can certainly rehab a property from afar if you want to, but the absolute number one key, no matter how you do it, if you're not local, is the quality of your team. You have to have trustworthy people because you are absolutely relying on these people to keep your investment afloat. So whether that's you get the turnkey team where the team members are kind of already there and you go through the turnkey company or if you do it all on your own, you maybe you need an agent, a contractor, a property manager, however you're going to do that. But those people are your lifeline. They're the only way that it's going to keep going. So it really kind of at that point becomes a difference of, you know, if you have a local property and you're the landlord, you're a little bit more in a technical position. You're the one fixing toilets or calling handyman or whatever, screening tenants, whatever it is. Whereas when you're long distance and you have team members doing all that stuff, your job at that point is really just managing those team members. So you're managing people instead of managing houses, if that makes any sense. Makes um, but at least that's been my experience of it, which is great for me because I don't want to fix a toilet and <laughs> landlording as I'm finding out in the last month or so is exhausting. So I bet. I bet. <laughs> you know, people say that you have to buy in your backyard and I just, I don't buy it, pun intended, I guess. Um, it, I don't, I, I think there's so many arguments for why that's not always true. Fascinating. Okay. So I'm really, really curious to, you know, know a little bit more about one of the Tonky um, deals. So if you can pick one deal, you know, we just use that as a case study and just tell us like, you know, what were the numbers and, you know, how did you find the deal? Was it through a Tonky provider or did you find it off market? Just kind of give us the, the spiel. Well, to be honest, I don't know if you're going to want to hear the numbers because they're so good. <laughs> and there is absolutely no option whatsoever of finding these numbers currently uh, today. <laughs> Tell us, do it. So, do it. You know, I'll put the disclaimer out that do not in any way think that you can find a deal like this in today's real estate market. When I bought, I'll just, I'll stick with my very first one because uh, I could start getting excited about all of them. But my very first one, I was pretty skeptical, skeptical about the turnkey thing. Like I was like, mm, 
sounds too good to be true. Like these guys are probably whatever. It's probably a con. I don't know. So I flew to Atlanta to tour. It was for, through a turnkey provider and to tour their operations, just kind of see what was going on and get a feel for it. So I met them in their office. They gave me a whole rundown of how their company works, how they do their work, blah, blah, blah. And then we went on a property tour. And so they showed me not only finished properties so I could see the quality of the rehab, but also uh, pre rehab properties. So like, here's what it is before, here's what we get it to. And that was kind of, it was pretty cool. But that very first property I bought, um, again, don't think you're going to get this anywhere. Uh, it was in Atlanta and it is, I believe it's 1400 square feet, give or take. It's two stories. It's absolutely adorable, if I do say so. It's a little yellow house in a nice, in a decent neighborhood. And I bought it for $55,000. And it was fully rehabbed. And at the time, it was running for nine seventy five dollars a month. So the returns on that were basically astronomical when you penciled them out. And the Atlanta was key at that time because they were anticipating a huge boom. And they had enough um factors or reasons to believe it was actually going to happen like you hear a lot of markets now and everyone's like oh it's gonna boom we promise and we're like mm, okay sure and they never do but atlanta it had started but it was still very much at the infant stage and so this huge boom was anticipated and i believe the last time i checked the value on that house i bought it for 55 and i think it was uh estimated roughly around a hundred or 120,000 or something. So it's easily doubled in value. I think the rent we're getting on it now is, I think we may only be getting a thousand for it, which is probably well below market rent, but we've had a long-term tenant in it. Um, yeah. It, um, wow. That, I, yeah. I feel bad Congratulations. Saying it. <laughs> yeah. That is a, that is an absolute fantastic deal. I mean, yeah. yeah, those numbers are crazy. And well, this was like Atlanta at the time was known, like one of the big reasons they were focusing, aside from the anticipated boom, was the price to rent ratios. Because in the crash of 2008, 2009, whenever it was, the rents didn't tank, but the housing prices did. So that was a huge factor in the market analysis is like, oh my God, the rents are completely normal, but now the price has dropped. So then when you buy at that price and you're getting these really high rents in comparison to the purchase price, I mean, that's like an investor's dream. And there's just, there's really, you know, the whole real estate market came up and we're, it's functioning, it's stable, everything's fine right now. And so you can't find that kind of thing but during that crash it was fantastic for investors oh wait that this is more than fantastic congratulations yeah. on that deal so yeah. yeah this is a good one so you kept going you kept going you bought you know a few more you still probably still buying but then you mentioned you you started your own company i did so what happened was i started getting in turnkeys and i was so daggum excited about them I was telling everybody who would listen to me and it was funny because like, um, cause every, you know, a lot of people are under the impression that you have to swing hammers and you have to do all these hard things and you have to negotiate deals. And that's honestly what kept me out of real estate investing for so long because I didn't want to do any of that. And so when people started hearing that I was somehow investing in real estate and I wasn't doing those things, they're like, wait, what are you buying? What do you mean you bought in Atlanta? How are you doing that? And so I would, tell them with all my excitement that came with it. And, uh, I think my cousin ended up buying one. One of my mom's friends ended up buying one. Like this, it became a thing and it was almost getting contagious around everyone around me. <laughs> and at some point the guys that I was working with said, you know, Hey, listen, you're already sending us people. If you will go get your real estate license, we can actually pay you a referral fee and kind of as like a thank you for sending us people. And I thought, well, that sounds like good, easy secondary income. Like if I'm already doing it, why not just make some free income on it? And so I did that. And one day I kind of woke up and I thought, wait a minute, if normal real estate agents can make a living doing this and I'm making the same as a normal real estate agent on these transactions, could I make a living doing this? And around that time, uh, I started writing for a big real estate investing website and just the traction of the whole thing was picking up to no end. And I ended up leaving my 
corporate job and I've been in the referral business ever since. And, you know, I like to tell people, I don't want anyone ever thinking that I send them to somewhere just because I get a paid a referral fee. Like I've kept it very boutique and I don't rec I don't refer anyone to deals or people that I haven't had personal experience with. So, you know, I've had a lot of people offer me referral fees along the years and uh, and quite frankly, they offer a lot more than I make and I've turned them down because I don't, you know, if I don't know them and I don't know what's going on, I'm not going to send people to them. So, you know, I like to put that out there just so no one thinks I'm just grabbing up the pennies or whatever, but yeah, it kind of, it morphed into its own business. Wow. So, and that business, so your, your business model is pretty much, you know, you refer someone to, you know, someone, you know, to a good deal and then you just get a, a, a split up or a commission from that deal. Yeah. And what I've really kind of started, I mean, not started doing, but what I've really seen over the years is the first thing that I do is I tell people who I've had good experience with, who I trust, you know, who I've bought my properties through. And then if that's all they need me for, that's totally fine. But what I also like to offer is support because turnkeys, especially, and my personality, like I attract a lot of brand new investors and a lot of new investors are terrified and they don't know who to trust and they don't know what questions to ask and they don't know whatever. So I offered to hold their hand through their first purchase. And once you buy a turnkey once, you kind of have the rhythm, like you don't really need a lot of help because it's just the same thing over and over. But for that first purchase, people just don't know what to expect or what they're doing. So I try and stick around if they want me as kind of a support system for that. And then I kind of laugh now, I used to call myself a glorified matchmaker, but over the years I've really started to see myself more as an emotional support animal. So, you know, <laughs> buying a big expensive property or whatever it is can, it, it can be a little scary and whatever. So I really try and stick around as that support system. And that even goes for after you've purchased. So if it's two years down the road and you have some kind of problem with your property manager or whatever, I want people to reach out to me and ask because I have a lot of resources. I know a lot of people in the equation and I've hardly ever seen it where me and the crew can't get something done on your behalf. Whereas if it's just you by yourself, you know, you may not have quite as much power behind you, whereas I have the power behind me. So, you know, I, it's kind of a lifetime support option. Congrats on, on that. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So, if I'm listening to this and I'm a, I'm a dualist and I'm thinking, uh, I've been really contemplating whether or not I should get my real estate license. What do you think? What are your thoughts just in general? Well, I certainly don't think it can hurt because I mean, there, I mean, you pay the fees like to take the test and then you pay fees and I guess it varies between states, but the fees in general are not really that expensive and it, it does take a good bit of studying and you have to take the test, but I don't really think there's, there'd be any way for anyone to be hurt by getting their license. Um, other than you spent a little bit of time studying and all that and a few fees, but it kind of depends on what you're wanting to do. So, uh, some people will try and tell you this isn't true, but legally, if you accept a commission or a referral fee or any kind of payment in the real estate industry, legally, you're supposed to have a license and a lot of wholesalers will try and say, Oh, well, no, it's a something, something fee, you know, like, I don't know, like there's of course gray areas about it, but if you want to always be absolutely certain that you're legal to accept money, then have your license be hung with a broker. Then that just takes that whole question out of it. So there's that end of it. But you know, if you're flipping houses and it's just your own personal house that, or, you know, you buy some kind of house and you, flip it or, you know, it's, you don't really have to have a license for that. Right. And so some people get licenses, A, to make sure they can legally accept referral fees, but also B, a lot of people want to be able to find listings themselves and not have to go through an agent. So if you want MLS access or even some off market access or whatever, like I don't use my license for that, but a lot of people would. So it really, it just depends on what you're getting in. But again, it's that whole, don't put the cart before the horse thing. Like, like I said, I was referring people already before it even came to my attention that I could get a license. And so, you know, again, if you put all these pieces together, but you've never done a deal, you don't even know if you need the license, but right. you know, but again, it, I don't think it could hurt by any means, but just, you know, make sure you need it really before you put the time into it, unless you just want to learn the information it teaches, which is okay too. So you quit your job. 
right? And this is what I call <laughs> this is what I call the promised land, right? Mm-hmm. For those out there who are at different stages of a real estate investing game, but are really looking in the distance, in the far distance of I can quit my job, I can quit my job, I can see it. Mm-hmm. What does that promised land look like? I mean, is it really true that you wake up, you know, whenever you want and you grab coffee and, you know, and just like live the life and chill on the beach? Is that really true? (laughs) Well, yes, that is true. I do all of those things. (laughs) However, that's not, you know, it's not all, uh, what's the phrase? Like rainbows and sunshine or whatever. Like, you know. If, at the point you leave your job, so you can leave your job in two ways, right? You can start your own business or you can invest in enough real estate where the real estate can fund your life. So I actually ended up doing a combination of both, which is more ironic than anything. It wasn't really planned. But, you know, if you leave your job to go to do a business, so you become an entrepreneur, whatever the business is, selling cookies or buying real estate, whatever it is. Entrepreneurship is a whole different roller coaster in and of itself. And by no means, yes, I have been sleeping in for five years and I have been drinking my coffee and I am a block from the beach. So I go to the beach quite often. Like there are, there really, I truly believe I've hit the promised land for sure, but that's not without serious amounts of stress and strain over the years. Just, you know, in the first couple of years, I didn't know where my rent payment was coming from. I didn't know where my food money was going to come from. And hmm. there's a lot of stress and it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's not just streamlined. You just put your toe into the promised land and everything's fine. It's not like that at all. But for me, the pros of being in the promised land way outweigh the cons. Like I would rather go through the emotional roller coaster and the stress and not knowing where my money's going to come from all day long. If it means I don't have to show up to an office at 9am on Monday. And, but then for real estate, if you go the real estate route and you can eventually leave your job, real estate's kind of nice because you can really do it over time. Like if you just continuously invest while you have income from somewhere else, which is your other job, that makes things a lot easier. So if you can find ways to make that, you want to, you're aiming for passive income or maybe you're, it's active income, you're flipping, but you're somehow getting money. And so you can do a lot of that outside of your regular job, which is fantastic. I would have, if I hadn't been so antsy at my job, I probably would have stuck around and tried to buy more in order to maximize that. But yeah, it's, you know, it is the, it is true. I, it's the promised land is real (laughs) and it is absolutely worth it. It's amazing. And I was just talking to a real estate person a couple hours ago and I was talking about how nice it is to, I actually go to bed when my body is tired and I wake up when my body says, wake up. And just, it seems like such a small thing, but between that and being able to live wherever I want, because I don't have to commute to a job. I mean, it really, I just, it's unbelievable. Like it really is true that the promised land exists. I'm so I'm so happy to hear that. And most importantly, I love the fact that you said, you know, before the pleasure of this promise line we're describing, there's a pain, right? I think that is so crucial because people think it's just all rose. It's not. You know, there's that pain that are you willing to to you know really endure that pain for that for that pleasure of the promise line? So thank you for sharing that that section. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and with that too, you know, I think there's also I think everyone should know that there is going to be stress involved and whatever, but I really truly believe whether it's the entrepreneur route that you go or the real estate route that you go, I believe fully that you will be tested. Like if you really want to get, make it to the promised land, you will be tested along the way. You're going to have real estate deals that absolutely fall through. You're going to have ones that just think this is not for you. They're going to make you want to hate real estate you know, and, or entrepreneurship, like you may have a couple months where you just can't find any money to pay for your rent, whatever it is. And I really, truly believe that so much of that is just hanging in through the test, surviving the test. And it's not even really a failure, but learning from it. Like, don't let it get you down because it is going to try really hard. And I feel like, I think if it were not for all of those tests and both those arenas, everybody can succeed, but a lot of people don't survive those tests. So if something goes haywire, it, 
it's okay. It's part of the process and keep going that way. That's how you get to the promised land. That it is so true. I feel like, I feel like you described my day <laughs> right there, just, just in there. Um, so before we get into the, the quick rounds, I quickly want us to touch on the Venice beach property. And like, you know, you said you were like really anti-landloading, but now you're feeling some brunt and pain of landloading. Um, so I want us to real quick, how did you find, you know, a deal in California. I mean, we always hear out there aren't any deals over there. And two, just generally share your experience of being a landlord. Well, it's a short experience, but it's it's loud in my head. <laughs> Let's just say that my sleeping in lately has been extremely hindered. Like I'm like, come on, guys. Like, see, I've never not slept in so much of my well, not in my life, but since I started entrepreneurship. Um, so the reality about California property and especially Southern California, Israel, there are not deals here for sure. And the deal that I got is for what it is, it's really good. But in comparison to an actual cash flowing rental property, or I, I kind of joke because I've been so pro cash flowing out of state rental properties with decent purchase prices and using property managers. Here I am now in a negative cash flow situation that I'm landlording. Like it's so contrary to everything I preach, but I think there, for the most part, a generalization can absolutely be made that there are not deals currently in California, unless you're really slick with something and you know how to be smarter than the system. And there are deals elsewhere, but I also believe that every investing situation can be extremely unique. Like I tell people all day long, for example, I've had people in California say, well, you know, I just can't bring myself to buy an out-of-state property. I just feel like I would lose sleep at night. I know the returns aren't here in California, but I would just feel so much better if I had something on my street. And at that, to that, I say, no investment deal whatsoever, in my opinion, is worth you losing sleep even if the numbers aren't there, or even if you buy a property that just doesn't seem to have quite the return, as long as you're not losing sleep, I prefer that because right. life's too short. We just don't need to stress that hard. Right. Um, so with this property in Venice, uh, we had been, I had been keeping an eye on properties for about a year, year and a half. And the idea was to make it a potential house hack for me because everyone who knows me knows that I live in a studio with no kitchen. And despite what everybody says, I love it. I've been here longer than anywhere else in my adult uh, life. I absolutely love my little apartment with no kitchen. And, but the whole idea was, you know, you're, you're a grown up now. Maybe you should have a kitchen. And so the idea was for me to house hack. And I argued my partners for so long on this saying that it's actually significantly cheaper for me to rent than it is to buy because even the property taxes alone on something I would buy would be more expensive than what I'm paying in rent. Like me paying rent right now is so cheap in comparison to owning something around here. And you know, things like mortgage interest, taxes, insurance, all that kind of stuff. And, but I kept an eye on properties anyways to kind of humor everybody. And this particular property came up and it just, the minute I walked into it, I, I just saw the angels singing. I was like, oh, okay, I, I kind of like this one. And so the numbers aren't horrific on it uh, as far as the negative cash flow, but it is a negative cash flow situation. But it's also a situation where the expectation is that this is my final home. I'm not going to move into it right now. Uh, because I'd basically be missing perfectly good free income if I stay where I am now, rent out all the units there. And then, but the long term goal is for me to eventually move into one of those units and that's it for the rest of my life. So when I ran numbers, you know, now and five years from now, they're horrible. But when I ran them 30 years from now, just the rent on two of the three units uh, by itself well covers the mortgage interest over 30 years. So because this is a lifelong hold and there's no expectation whatsoever of getting rid of it and it's in Venice beach, which means there's always going to be options like the exit strategy options on this are huge. Even if I don't want it to be my forever home, I can always rent it out. Airbnb is an option. Long term is an option. Everybody wants to be in Venice. Venice is squished between two hugely appreciated cities, Santa Monica and Playa Vista. You know, it's it, everything, the fundamentals are there. 
the numbers currently aren't there right now, but everything else is holding really strong. And over the long term, the numbers are there by a lot. So, you know, I really encourage people, there are unique situations when what looks not great on paper could be a good deal. Like in this case, this is a pretty cool deal for me, but you know, it's, um, it's just a different animal. So again, it goes into what you're looking for and what resources you have. Right. Awesome. Awesome. So we're definitely, definitely dwelling into the quick round. So these are going to be okay. quick questions, quick answers. You ready? I, ooh, I think so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> First question. What makes Ali unique? What is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next guy or the next girl? I am absolutely the biggest rebel on the planet. Like if there's some way to be rebellious in any regard, that's me. And I, I feel like that has kept me very different from everybody else, just in the ways I approach everything. I love it. I love it. Second question. What was the last book that you read and what was the one thing that you picked up from that book? Uh, well, to be totally fair, the last books I've read have been a lot more psychology based. <laughs> I, really? I have a huge uh, psychology background also, and I love that kind of stuff. So I haven't read a business or real estate book in a while, but off the top of my head, uh, my favorite business book, which I absolutely think can apply very directly to real estate as well, is The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. I think it is it's almost as imperative as rich dad poor dad in my mind great book great book last question so you've got you know your portfolios of properties out of state you're you know really loving life in venice beach um you know you've got your consulting referral business that's growing um you're helping and hand holding you know newbies and investors what do you do for fun Ooh. Uh, I love fun. Uh, I love traveling. I just got back from a week long in Alaska about a month ago. I went chasing northern lights and we did like ice fishing and snowmobiling and cross country skiing. It was absolutely to die for. I love traveling. I love anything outdoors based. And uh, this is technically my latest volunteer gig, but for me, it is so fun and so enjoyable is I actually go pretty regularly into California prisons. And I work directly with the inmates. Um, just I, that is that's my jam. I hate to say that one of my hobbies is now you know more of a business type, but it's volunteering. But it's I, it is so enjoyable for me to hang with those guys. Um, yeah, so I I'm love it all over the map. And I also fly airplanes, which is my fun side gig. And so that's my that's more fun work. Wow! Thank you so much for that. That is that is really cool. Thank you so much. So if I'm a dual listener and I'm like, oh my goodness, I love what Ali's talking about. I really like Ali. I want to connect with her. I want to find more about her business. Maybe she can help me. Maybe I'm in, I mean, I have a, a pretty strong listenership in California, actually. So if there's somebody okay. there, yeah, and they want to connect with you, how can people reach out to you, you know, your business, your website? Yeah, the easiest way to get a hold of me is just to email me directly. It's Ali, A-L-I at hipsterinvestments.com and as soon as you email me there we can if you want to talk business if you want to talk real estate uh my real estate company's website is www.hipsterinvestments.com and my consulting website is just alliboone.com a-l-i-b-o-o-n-e that one is not fancy at all that's a newer thing um mm -hmm. but yeah you know reach out uh i do business consulting i do the real estate stuff and i also just like saying hi to people so you know if you just want to network and say hi and, and have fun with a friendly face I love talking to people I work by myself at home and my dog gets tired of me talking to her so <laughs> <laughs> I love a new excuse to talk to other humans I love it thank you so much Ali I mean I learned so much myself I really appreciate your time thank you so much you bet well thank you for having me I love I love it I, it's so fun to get to talk to similar audiences you may have heard this phrase, there are a thousand ways to make a thousand dollars in real estate. Well, now you can actually tune into the world's longest running daily real estate podcast with over a thousand podcasts and still going. The best real estate investing advice ever is hosted by a very good friend of mine, Joe Fellas. His show features influential thought leaders sharing their best 
advice ever with none of the fluff you just got to check this stuff out so listen and subscribe at the best ever show.com that's the best ever show.com thank you so much guys for listening and i definitely can't wait to chat to you guys on the next episode